Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. I'm writing this at my neighbor's house, where we're currently waiting for the police. I suppose I'll tell them the same thing I told Jack when I came banging on his door this morning. I can't exactly tell them the truth. They wouldn't believe a word of it, and I can't say I'd blame them. I'm not sure why I'm even telling you, except you may be the only people who would believe me, and I have to tell someone or I think I'll lose my damn mind. For context, my house sits on a good amount of land that sits next to a large open field to the left of it. There's a few acres of trees beyond the field. A small forest, as my wife likes to say. Our closest neighbor Jack lives about a mile and a half down the road so we pretty much have the space all to ourselves. Our own little pocket of paradise, beautiful and safe. Well, that's how I used to think of it. Now I don't feel safe here, not at all. It's tainted to me now, and I don't know what to do. I've never seen anything like this before. If anyone reading this has ever been in a similar situation, or possibly knows what it could be, and most importantly what I can do, please reach out. Last spring, Michelle, my wife, thought it would be a good idea to get one of those doorbell cameras. We'd had some things go missing as well as some minor destruction on our property. Nothing too serious. Just a few broken flower pots and some missing lawn ornaments. I tried to tell her it was probably some teenagers from town, just finding something exciting to do, but she wouldn't hear of it. She didn't care about the flower pots or lawn ornaments that much, but she didn't want the situation to escalate into a home invasion. I thought that was a little dramatic, but I knew when to keep my mouth shut. So we bought the camera and I installed it the same day, right up by our porch lights, so that we could get a view of the front door and as much of the front of our property in the shot as possible. After two days we finally solved the mystery of the missing lawn decor. You probably already figured it out. If you guessed two raccoons you'd be dead on. It was kinda hilarious watching them scooping up my wife's solar garden lights and carrying them off on two legs, watching them running away with those bright blue bulbs in their hands like two little burglars was pretty funny. They even looked the part with those masks. Even Michelle couldn't keep a straight face. I wondered what they were doing with all the stolen goods, maybe sprucing up their digs out in the forest. Michelle started putting out bowls of cat kibble, and amazingly the thievery stopped. We still kept the camera up, though. Turns out it would come in handy. Michelle has been out of town for work for the last four days. She was supposed to be home last night around dinner, but called to tell me the plane had been delayed, and she wouldn't be home until 4 a.m. or later. I told her I loved her, and I'd see her when she came home. And that was that. It was an average night. Nothing out of the ordinary. I straightened up the house so she wouldn't come home to a disaster. I made some soup for dinner and fed the cat. After me and Mona curled up on the couch together, me watching TV while she purred on my chest. I went to sleep around 2 a.m. I'd only slept a little over an hour before I was woken up by an alert on my phone, a notification for the security camera. Now it wasn't unusual to get an alert, especially late at night. It was always some little critter, a fox or raccoon. But I grabbed my phone off my nightstand to check anyway. It was well after 2 and my immediate thought was that Michelle had gotten home earlier than she thought she would. I laid there listening for the sound of Michelle letting herself in, but it never came. Only silence. I groaned, figuring she'd forgotten her keys. Wouldn't be the first time. She was notorious for leaving them behind. Probably forgot them at the hotel or airport. I didn't jump right up to check, though, as I still hadn't heard her knock. So I opened the app and pulled up the live feed. Michelle was standing on the front porch, just staring at the door. I sat up, about to go let her in, when something stopped me. It was her face. She was smiling. Not just any smile, but one that I'd never seen before. A weird, thin-lipped grin that stretched the width of her face, like someone trying to show off all of their teeth. She stayed that way for a long moment, like a creepy mannequin. After a minute, her lips slowly puckered out into a pout as though she were an upset toddler. She held that expression for a minute, then her lips dropped downwards, and a deep-set frown etched across her forehead. 
I sat there in bed, staring at my wife practicing different facial expressions, as if she were brand new at such a concept. It was bizarre and a little unsettling. She continued to go through each movement, seeming to take her time with each one. Smile, pout, frown, repeat. After watching her for nearly fifteen minutes, I finally recovered from my shock and confusion and pressed the intercom. Babe, what on earth are you doing? I said. Her head snapped towards the camera, looking up at it with wide eyes. It was as if she had forgotten the camera was even there. Her mouth was partially hanging open on one side, caught between a smile and a frown. She didn't answer me, only continued to stare, her face frozen in that disturbing look. I waited for a long moment, unsure how to proceed. The longer I watched her, the more I realized just how strange she looked. I didn't notice at first, being half asleep, but now that I was wide awake, it was so obvious that I wondered how I could have not noticed immediately. For starters, she seemed much taller. The top of her head came to just over the little rod we used to hang our different holiday flags, the one I have to stand on my tiptoes to be able to reach. That wasn't the only odd thing about her. Her arms were much too long, hanging down past her knees. Even her face was different. It resembled her, enough that it wasn't instantly noticeable, but when I really looked, I could see that her face seemed more narrow, as if it had been stretched from the top of her head to her jaw, and the skin looked too tight, as if it were two sizes too small, the bones underneath pushing hard against the flesh. I was beginning to panic at that point. I didn't know if she'd been in some horrible accident or what, but I knew something was very wrong with her. Honey, are you hurt? I asked, my voice shaking. In response to my question, Michelle stamped her foot down on the porch hard, shaking her head. Before I could say anything else, she reached out and took hold of the doorknob and jiggled it fiercely. I was instantly filled with dread at the mere thought of her getting in. I'm not letting you inside, I said quickly. I could hear her jiggling the knob frantically, her face still staring up at the camera. She finally let go after a few minutes and made a sound almost like laughing. The sound of it made my skin crawl. I'm home, she said. Her voice, like her face, was similar but not a complete match. It went from nasally to almost baby-like. I'm home. Open the door. I almost closed the app and called 911 right then and there, but I'll admit I was afraid my wife was having some sort of medical emergency. Maybe I should call for help, I said. She shook her head again, her long hair whipping from side to side. Then something happened and that image will stick with me for the rest of my life. Michelle, or the thing that was desperately trying to be her, seemed to stretch right in front of my eyes. Her torso thinned out and grew so that her head slid against the ceiling. Its skin looked so tight that I could actually hear it pulling, wobbling, and rubber-like. It had obvious trouble staying on two feet, but it managed. It tried to close its mouth, but it couldn't do it completely, and its jaw just sort of hung there against its chest. I'm calling the police! I shouted, fear overwhelming me. The moment the words left my mouth, her face twisted in a look of pure hatred. It was like I could feel it radiating through the screen. I had never seen such hate and rage in my life, certainly not on my wife's face. Quick as a flash, she dropped down onto the porch and crawled down the steps and onto the lawn. I watched in horror as she crawled towards the field, her long arms bent at sickening angles. She reached the edge of the field and disappeared in the tall grass. I sat watching the screen, my heart racing. I was too afraid to look away even for a moment. After an hour without seeing her again, I finally felt safe enough to set the phone down and try to sleep. I thought about calling my wife, but part of me was too scared I'd hear that poor imitation on the other end. I fell into a restless sleep some time later. I didn't sleep long before my phone woke me again. Another notification. I pulled up the app and held my breath, terrified at what I'd see. When the feed came up, I knew right away that I was looking at my wife. Relief flooded my body. She was standing on the porch, her suitcase at her feet as she rummaged through her purse, probably searching for her keys. Lost your keys again, I said, pressing the intercom. She jumped at the sound of my voice, almost dropping her purse. You're up, she said, smiling. Looks like I have lost my keys. Mind letting me in? She said, batting her eyes up at the camera. I couldn't help but smile. She always had a way of making me feel completely at ease, even after witnessing a nightmare just hours prior. 
I suppose I wouldn't be a very good husband if I let you sleep on the porch all night, I teased. She grinned up at me and I told her to hang on. I sat up and slipped on my slippers and got to my feet. That's when I caught some movement on the screen. Far off in the field a head rose up from the grass, standing tall on a neck much too long to come from anything human. A whimper escaped my lips and I nearly dropped my phone. I was glued to the floor, unable to look away from that thing watching my house. The head bobbed slightly, then the body rose upwards to meet the head, like a slinky sliding back in position. It stood in the field watching, then to my terror it began shuffling quickly towards the house on jerky legs. I couldn't help but scream. It was coming for my wife and it was coming fast, even with its unstable gait. I ran down the hall, dropping my phone in the process, skipping steps as I raced down them. I lost my footing when I hit the bottom and skidded across the front hall, colliding into the front door. I was screaming incoherently, fumbling with the locks. I could hear my wife's concerned voice asking me what was wrong. Then just as I was working to flip the deadbolt, I heard her scream, this time in pure fear. I finally managed to flip the deadbolt and rip the door open, taking a handful of her jacket and yanking her inside, locking the door behind her. I leaned against the door, panting hard. I heard a muffled thump on the porch, but then it was quiet. My wife was scared, pale and nearly in tears. She refused to talk about what she'd seen and didn't want to see the footage of the thing on our porch. I let her get some sleep, assuring her that the house was secure. I stayed up, checking the windows and the live feed. I watched the field for any sign of that thing, but it seemed like it was gone. Soon after Michelle went to sleep, I decided to look at the video to see if I could tell where it went off to. I was scared to see it again. Maybe that's why I waited. I pulled up the video and watched that thing shambling across the field towards my house, its long arms outstretched and a look of longing on its face. Its smile was terrible the closer it got. I saw my wife on the screen growing worried as she heard me screaming through the house, totally unaware of the danger she was in, of the thing that was just mere feet behind her. I could barely make it through the entire video, watching it get closer and closer. Just as it reached the porch, I could hear myself trying to unlock the door. But seconds before I pulled it open, those long arms reached out, gripping my wife by her shoulders and ripping her backwards off the porch, my wife able to scream only once. I didn't see what it did with her, but I did see it step up onto the porch, positioning itself in front of the door, its limbs adjusting to a more human appearance. Just before my hand shot out to pull it inside, that thing grinned up at the camera, its lips stretched impossibly wide. For a moment I almost didn't believe it. It was as if my brain wouldn't allow it. But as I stood in the hallway, attempting to process what I'd seen and what that meant, I heard the unmistakable sound of something shuffling up behind me. I ran then. I didn't look behind me. I didn't want to see what I knew I would see. Something eerily similar to my wife with gangly limbs and skin stretched taut over sharp bones. I knew if I looked back my mind would snap and I'd never recover. I ran faster than I ever have, tearing off out of the house and down the road, too terrified to look back even once, sure I'd see those long arms desperately reaching for me. I made it to my neighbor's house and pounded on the door. I told him that there was an intruder. I didn't know what else to say. He'd never believe the truth. We went back to my house armed with Jack's rifle, but of course the house was empty. We couldn't find Michelle either. All we found were what looked like drag marks through my lawn, running right through the field. I didn't have to look at the video to know what made those tracks. We searched the field in the woods, but didn't find much other than some strands of hair that looked an awful lot like Michelle's. The hair was high up on a branch, in a tree that would be extremely difficult to climb. Jack said it must have been a bird that had done it. Flew the hair up there for nesting material. I guess he didn't see the blood splatter along the trunk. We eventually went back to Jack's place and called the police. Jack thought it best. I agreed, but I know it won't make much of a difference. Michelle is long gone by now. I just hope she didn't suffer. The guilt I feel for not saving her, for not knowing that thing wasn't my wife, is so profound it aches to breathe. I deleted the videos. I couldn't bear to watch them again. I think my mind would have broke completely if I had. The police are here, finally done with their search of the woods. 
I guess I'll have to go through the motions. It's not like I have any other choice. Not unless I want to spend the rest of my days in a padded room. Although considering the alternative, it's not a bad idea. If you have any experience with this, or have any clue what I should do if it comes back, please let me know. I have a strong suspicion that it will be back, and God knows who it'll look like then, because Jack's been acting a bit jittery ever since we came back from the woods, and it may just be my imagination, brought on by stress and grief, but Jack's skin seems to be stretched a little too thin. The following was found in an envelope on a bus bound for Chicago. My name is Jason Grimes, and I am writing this so that when the room is eventually opened, people will perhaps understand the things they find within it, and so that I will not be thought of as the madman that part of me already fears I am. It all began with the reading of the will. My mother, my only living parent left, had passed away due to a heart attack in her New England home. Her body had been found by one of the women who came to clean every few days, and the news had not come as a shock to any of the family. She'd had two previous heart attacks, and with her smoking and drinking she wasn't exactly in the best of health. It all began with the reading of the will. My mother, my only living parent left, had passed away due to a heart attack in her New England home. Her body had been found by one of the women who came to clean every few days, and the news had not come as a shock to any of the family. She'd had two previous heart attacks, and with her smoking and drinking, she wasn't exactly in the best of health. Had been a surprise that she wanted me to have the old family home, though. I'd never exactly had much love for the place and had moved out the first chance I got. Honestly, I hadn't been expecting to get anything in the will, given how long it had been since we'd even spoken. I was surprised that she hadn't written me out the way she'd tried to write me out of the family's history by removing any pictures of me from the house. I certainly didn't plan to keep that creepy, run-down old place. But at the same time, I knew that there was a chance it could fetch a bit of cash on the market if someone put a little work into fixing it up. And as I was currently between jobs, it might be a worthwhile use of my time. I got my brother and our cousin to come over and help with fixing it up, which they happily agreed to do. There actually wasn't as much work to do as I had first thought, as the house seemed to be in better repair than I remembered it being. I guessed that my mother, cheap as she was, had still finally been forced to actually get someone in to fix up some of the bigger problems the house had. There was still stuff that needed repair and a new coat of paint, but it only ended up taking about a week or so in the end. It was during this time that I first found it. Now, I didn't have the best memories of the old place given how long it had been since I had stayed there. But one of the first things I noticed while I was walking along the ground floor hallway was that there was a door that hadn't been there before. I stared at it for a few moments, more out of confusion than anything else before trying to push it open. It wouldn't budge an inch. I asked my brother if he knew what might be down there and he shook his head, saying that he'd not even noticed it before now. My cousin said that she'd noticed a big, old-fashioned-looking key in the keyhole of the door the last time she'd come round to visit, but she had no clue where it might be right now. I shrugged, not really thinking much of it at the time, just figuring that I'd had to get someone to bust the door down at some point before I got the house sold. The room none of us wanted to go in was Emerson's. It was weird seeing all his old toys and coloring books still there as if our mother had been trying to bring her son back by clinging onto the past. Emerson had always been our mother's favorite, the one who she'd lavished all of her attention on, and I saw that she had stuck his drawings up all over the place. Drawings of pirate ships and odd, comical-looking figures with strange designs. My brother told me that when he'd stayed for dinner, our mother would still set a place for Emerson as if she expected him to just show up out of the blue. Missing for all these years, and she was still expecting him to come wandering through the door. That first night I spent alone in the house, I didn't sleep very well. Crazy as it sounds, I kept thinking that I heard noises in the house, people talking to each other. I must have checked each and every one of the rooms a good dozen times, only to find each and every one of them empty. I even checked to see if I'd left the TV on, but it was still unplugged. I would go back to bed, and then, after a little while... The noises would start up again. Sometimes I was sure that I could hear music as well. 
It was around four in the morning that a thought occurred to me, and I went to the locked door in the hallway, pressing my ear against it and listening closely. I was sure I heard what sounded like a muffled tune coming from within. The next day I went into town to buy some food, and after the events of last night, I also bought a hammer to knock that old door down. It was while chatting with the cashier that I learned something unsettling about the neighborhood that I had temporarily moved into. I had casually brought up where I was staying after he commented on me being new around here and told him that I was planning to try and sell up. He'd let out a short burst of laughter before looking embarrassed about it, and when I'd asked him to explain had said the following, No one with sense is going to buy that dump. No one with half a brain would buy any house within ten miles of that place, he said, not looking up from the groceries he was packing away. Why not? It seems like a nice enough neighborhood, I had replied. Because of all them kids going missing, of course. He'd gone on to explain that for the past few years there had been a sudden and disturbing rise in the number of children vanishing from their homes in the area. There had been search parties formed. The police and the FBI had gotten involved, but nothing had turned up. The kids had vanished from their homes with no signs of forced entry or struggle, and no evidence left behind as to who might have been responsible. People were trying to move away as fast as possible, but there were few who would buy a house in the area once they heard about what was going on. No one wanted to move to a place where a child kidnapper killer was active. I have to admit the story kind of creeped me out. Knowing that something so strange was going on near where I was staying made the odd goings-on of the previous night seem even more unsettling to me, and so as soon as I got home, I decided to bust that door down. My neighbor, a fairly nice young woman named Charlie who I'd gotten to know, was working on her home's front lawn when I got back and noticed the hammer in my hand as I headed towards the front door of my home. Not really wanting to be alone when I broke the door down, I gave her an abridged version of events, leaving out the odd noises of last night, and asked if she'd like to join me in finding out what was in the room. Mysterious locked door? Very Scooby-Doo, she said as I grinned. Sure. I'll be Fred, you be Daphne, I replied happy to have someone with me, her presence making the nervousness I had felt while listening to the cashier's story start to fade a little. Trust me, I'm more Velma than Daphne. Once inside the house, I packed away the various groceries, pouring drinks for myself and Charlie before we went to the white door. It only took a few swings from the hammer to smash it open, the lock breaking beneath the assault and the door swinging open. Behind it was a staircase, leading down into a darkened basement below. I stared in confusion at the stairs, not believing what I was seeing. Our house didn't have a basement, I was sure of that. And yet suddenly I seemed to recall seeing this before. I could remember playing with Emerson one day, daring each other. Emerson had always been afraid of pretty much everything, and I, in the way of older brothers everywhere, had taken far too much pleasure in tormenting him. I seemed to remember the two of us stood at the top of this staircase, me daring him to go down into the dark while calling him a chicken. Come on, Emerson, I had been saying to him. You have to go inside. Charlie and I began to descend the old creaking steps towards the basement, the hammer still clutched tight in my hands. I didn't know what we would find, but I knew that I felt better being armed with something that could do some damage. As we reached the bottom of the stairs, Charlie began feeling around for a light switch, finding one after a few moments and flicking it on. The room was instantly illuminated, revealing what was within. Oh my God, look at all this cool stuff, Charlie cried out. The basement was full of puppets. There were dozens of them, all lined up on various shelves, all in very good repair, as if they were brand new. There were puppets of all shapes and sizes, some of them being very human-looking, while others were Muppet-like animal creatures, and others were more monstrous. There were props from what looked like the set of a kid's show, I guess. None of it had any dust on it, as if someone had been down to tidy up just moments before. I could guess what all of this was from, but what it was doing down here I had no idea. What is all of this? Charlie asked as she picked up one of the puppets, a guy with a massive mustache and a monocle over one eye. She grinned, playing around with him, moving his limbs up and down. My brother used to work on a kid's show years ago, Pirate Place, I think it was called. Only ran for a couple of years before it got cancelled. I guess this stuff is all the old puppets and sets from the show, I said as we looked around at the room. My eyes fell on a creepy-looking skeleton puppet with a really weird mouth and a top hat upon its head. 
ugly-looking thing, I thought to myself at that moment. No way. Do you have any idea how much some of this stuff might be worth? Collectors pay a fortune for things like this on eBay, Charlie said, setting the puppet down gently on one of the shelves. I glanced around at the rest of the contents of the room. Apart from the puppets and the set pieces, there was an old sewing machine set on a desk that was otherwise completely bare. There was no sign of anything that could have been the source of the tune that I'd heard before. Deciding that I must have imagined it, probably due to lack of sleep and being back in the old place, I did my best to forget about my fears and concentrate on the opportunity before me now. There was just one thing that troubled me as I looked around. On the desk the sewing machine was set on, there were several odd red stains spattered over it. As I stared at them, I was sure, out of the corner of my eye, that the odd-looking skeleton puppet's head had twitched in my direction. The next few days went by without anything odd happening, really. I put the puppets up on eBay and had a few people come to view the house. The only thing that was strange was when one couple viewed the basement. All of the color drained out of the husband's face when his eyes fell on the skeleton puppet, and he just turned, left the basement, and then the house. He went to the car, started it up, and sat there until his wife joined him, after apologizing for his rudeness, and the two drove away. Later that night I was sure I heard the old sewing machine in the basement. I wanted to go down and check, and yet at the same time looking at that darkened doorway, I suddenly felt very frightened. And when there was a knock at the door, the sudden noise almost made me jump out of my skin, my head jerking to the side towards the source of the noise. Taking a moment to steady my nerves, I walked to the door, opening it cautiously to see Charlie standing there. We need to talk, she said. She explained that she'd mentioned to a friend of hers about the find in the basement a few days ago, when she'd brought up the name Pirate Place. He'd gone quiet and asked for her to describe the puppets. He looked afraid, she said, as if he'd just seen a ghost. He had told her to move house, to get away from me and from those damn things, as he referred to the puppets, growing increasingly hysterical as the conversation had gone on. He'd repeated over and over that it wasn't safe to be around them, that they could see you through them. He'd rambled at length about physical avatars and the signal, none of which had made any sense to her. Apparently he'd used to work in television and had known my brother. He said that he'd sat down with Emerson in what he called the script room and then started raving about knowing where the stories came from. Charlie said that she had never seen him like this before, that he seemed to be almost psychotic, his eyes bugging out of his head, his face glistening with sweat. She had been worried that he was about to have some kind of attack. Was your brother involved in anything weird? She asked me, and I honestly didn't know how to respond to that. Emerson had always been an odd kid, no doubt about that, but I couldn't imagine him ever provoking such a frightened reaction in anyone, let alone a grown man. I asked her if he'd said why the puppets were so awful, and she shrugged. All the stuff he was saying wasn't making much sense. He just said, it's not the puppets, it's what made them. And then he just got up and said, he couldn't be in my house anymore, just ran out to his car and drove off. I decided that as she'd shared her weirdness with me, maybe I could open up about some of the weirdness in my life right now. I explained about the odd noises, the music and the sewing machine seeming to turn itself on, and against my better judgment, we decided to descend into that pitch-black basement once again. I'm not sure what I expected to find, but I was sure that something would be wrong. So when we saw that nothing seemed to have changed or been moved, I felt an odd sense of almost disappointment. I kind of wanted for there to be something strange down there, just to prove that I wasn't imagining all of this, to prove to myself that I wasn't going crazy. And that's when Charlie spotted the door. It was when she flicked off the light as we began to go up, casting one last look back into the darkness, and noticed that there was light coming from somewhere. Not very bright, but nonetheless a light source. Moving swiftly, we shoved aside one of the shelves of puppets and felt along the wall behind it to confirm what Charlie had believed to be the case. There was a door behind it. Told you this was all kinds of Scooby-Doo, Charlie said with a grin on her face, clearly enjoying herself. I smiled, which was something I definitely wouldn't have been able to do if she wasn't here. It was nice to have someone to share this insanity with. 
We felt along the wall trying to find some way to open the door, some handle or switch to make it open. From behind it I was sure that I could hear something. It sounded almost like music. Circus music. A cheerful, upbeat tune, but also off somehow, as if there was something not quite right about it. Out of the corner of my eye I was sure that the puppet with the ridiculous mustache and monocle had moved. And I realize how ridiculous that sounds, but I was certain of it. It was just the tiniest movement, a twitch of its head toward the skeleton puppet. As if waiting for orders, I thought to myself, and then wondered why that had popped into my head. With a bit of work we managed to strip away the wallpaper that was covering most of the door, revealing that it was a bright red in color, the paint chipped and flaking in places, with a small keyhole and no handle. I assumed that it just pushed inwards once unlocked, or perhaps slid to the side as there was no place for a handle to have once been either. It was then that I noticed that Charlie had stopped smiling. In fact, she was staring at the door with what looked like a mix of confusion and fear, taking a few steps back from it. When I asked her what was wrong, she just shook her head and made excuses to leave. I asked her if she was all right, and she just told me she was tired and promised to help me try and find the key to the door in the morning. It was getting late, so it was plausible enough, but I knew that something was wrong here. For the rest of the evening, I looked through Emerson's old things in his room, looking for some clue, perhaps, as to what it was that had inspired such fear in Charlie's friend. For the most part, it was old toys and childhood drawings, nothing of much use. There were a few things that were odd, though. It was a picture that I guess Emerson had done when he was little. There was a crude drawing of a boy sat in his bed that I think was meant to be Emerson himself. Around him were stood several figures. One was just a stick figure with a hat upon its head. Another was a portly man with a cartoonish mustache and teeth. And there was a third that was very odd. It was just a scribble in the outline of a person, a black, shadowy scribble. There was a circle drawn above the three figures, and the boy and lines were shown coming down from it, leading to the boy's head. For some reason, looking at those lines, the word tendrils came into my head. There was a picture of a red door. The words where they take them were scrawled in large letters beneath it. And the final picture was of the stick man and the man with the mustache leading several smaller figures towards a third. This one was a woman, a rather well-drawn one in comparison to the crude, basic nature of the others, except for the face. The face was just two dots for eyes and a line for a mouth. The words where they take them were written here as well. There was a message on my answering machine from Charlie the next day. She said that she'd gone to stay with her girlfriend for a few days, just to clear her head, and apologized for leaving so suddenly the previous night. Her voice sounded odd, kind of shaky really, and she said not to bother with the door. She tried to sound calm and casual when she said it, but there was fear in her voice. She said it was probably best to forget all about the whole thing and just cover up the basement not even mention it to potential buyers for the house. She said it would be a good idea to take the puppets off of eBay as well. I should have just done as she asked. Instead, I spent the rest of the day ransacking the house, searching for the key to that door. I looked everywhere with little success until, almost on a whim, I decided to search Emerson's room more thoroughly. And there, hidden in one of his old pillowcases, was a key. I poured myself a drink to steady my nerves, sitting down to watch the TV. I remembered the old thing never picking up much when we were little, the channels always being full of static. It seemed to be working better now, at least, and the news came on, talking about another disappearance in the area. A girl of twelve this time vanished from her home in the middle of the night. I flipped through the channels looking for something a little less grim while I finished my drink. Getting up, I headed down the steps into the basement, striding toward the door, ready to open it. The skeleton puppet was sat at the sewing machine now. I knew I hadn't moved it, and neither had Charlie, and the other puppets. Their heads seemed to be turned towards it, as if they were waiting for it to do something, to say something. God, it was a hideous thing, that awful misshapen mouth looking so awful. God knows why the prop designer had made it look that way. At that moment... The words to grind your skin popped into my head. I put the key into the door, and sure enough, it unlocked it, the door pushing inward with ease, revealing the room that lay beyond it. It was illuminated by a single dirty bulb, making the contents of the room easy to see. Dear Lord, the smell. 
The only thing worse was the sight of what was littered around the room. Children's shoes and clothes, some spattered with old dried blood, were piled in a heap in one corner of the room. The floor was stained with large patches of red, one of which, as I stepped into it, I realized was still somewhat fresh, fresh and sticky like soda spilled on a movie theater floor. The room smelt of spoiling meat and burnt hair, and it took all I had not to throw up as I entered it, wondering how the smell hadn't traveled from this room to the basement. There was a pile of old video cassettes in one corner of the room, all labeled with things like Emerson's first bike ride and Emerson's first spelling bee, all old home movies, I guess. But mixed in with them were tapes labeled Candle Cove, Episode 4, and Season 3, Pilot Episode. I picked up a few and noticed that there were bloody fingerprints on several. There was a series of steps leading down further into the blackness at the rear of the room, and I felt oddly compelled to go down there. How far down did this go? How was this even here beneath my family home without me ever knowing of it? And yet, and yet I felt like I did know about it. Looking at those steps, I felt like I remembered being in this room before. I was a child, and it had been empty then and there I stood with Emerson at the foot of these stairs. Emerson, you have to go inside, I had whispered to him, taking delight in how terrified he looked. He had gone down into the dark and, and my head throbbed with pain. It actually physically hurt to try and remember, as if something was willing me not to. Had there been someone down there with us? I was sure I remembered there being someone in the room besides the two of us, the more I thought about it. Our mother. No, not our mother, but another woman. Why couldn't I remember her face? I began to take unsteady steps down the stairs. The more I walked, the closer I got to another door, another red door. The key fit the lock of this one as well, and it opened with ease. There was music coming from within now, and the sound of waves crashing against the shore. I felt it pulling me towards it, calling to me like a siren song. I had to go inside, I thought to myself. I had to go inside. I wasn't alone in this room. I burned all the puppets later that night. Not that I imagine it matters. They've been destroyed before and it hasn't stopped them from coming back. They're just wood and paint and cloth, nothing but a conduit. They allow them to come through, allow them to walk through the door and come here. Oh God, the door. I know where they go now. I know where they go, oh Christ, oh Jesus, please help me, I know where they go. I saw it. They took me there the way they took my brother when he was a child. They need us. I don't know why they need us, but they need us, that's what he said through that horrible misshapen mouth, those eyes rolling in his sockets wildly. They needed my brother, and they need me. My family is not safe. The signal needs us. The story needs us. The ship came to that cave. Emerson was laughing and crying at the same time as he spoke the words I knew were coming. As he told me what I had to do, it was waiting for me. I saw the, the following portion of the letter has been heavily crossed out, making it almost impossible to read. A word that may or may not be mannequin appears at one point in the letter, and the word skin is visible at several points in the following two paragraphs. What could be faker or taker can also be made out in the second paragraph and ship in the final sentence. The letter resumes. I ran. You may think me a coward for not helping them, not even trying to save them, but I know where the ship is taking them now. I know where the voyage leads, and I know who is waiting at the end. I would pray to God, but no, that will do no good. I know now. I know things that no one should ever know. I know what Emerson learned. That day the signal found him. I know the things he learned in the dark places where the music comes from. Music played on instruments crafted of bone and organs, wrapped in flesh. It's always there now in my head, playing on an endless loop. The signal has found me like it found Emerson that day I made him go down those stairs, like it found our mother. I know why she did what she did. I know what she knew and I know where Emerson is. I saw him on the ship. My God, the ship. The laughing was the worst. I wish it would stop laughing. I have sealed up the basement but know that one day someone will go down there again. I write this so that when they discover the things I know they will find down there, they will know neither I nor my mother were responsible. And perhaps so, they will have the courage to do what I do not, and destroy this terrible place, burn it to the ground. 
The only thing that holds me back is the fear that perhaps this place is not merely the door to their cage, but the cage itself. If the house were to be destroyed, perhaps they would be able to spread. I wish to apologize to my family. I hope they will forgive me for what I am about to do. I hope they will understand. My brother, if this reaches you, please do not go into that house and don't sell it. Board it up and let it stand forgotten, a creepy old building for people to stare and wonder at. Maybe that will hold them back at least. The sewing machine is going at all hours of the day now. I know that it's him, sewing himself new additions to that terrible cape. She lets him keep the skin, you see. He gets to keep the skin. I am so sorry, Emerson. I don't hate you for the things you did. I wish I could help you, or at least put you out of your misery. I know they won't let you rest. I know you cannot be free of them now. I see them out of the corner of my eye sometimes. They're going to take me to the ship. I won't let them. I will die the way I choose. The sea will carry my body away, hopefully far from where they can ever find it. This letter was found lying beside a cassette tape. The tape proved to be nothing but static, although those who watched it reportedly felt a sense of unease and nausea when they tried to view it. The Grimes' home was searched, and the belongings of over 23 children who had gone missing in the local area were discovered within. No trace of the children themselves was found within the house or near it, however. The basement and the secret room were both as the letter described them. However, no stairs leading down to a further sub-basement were found anywhere on the property. The puppets all also appeared to be completely undamaged, despite the claim that they had been burnt. The tapes mentioned in the letter were missing, however. Two families have since lived in the Grimes' home. Neither has stayed for more than a few months, reporting strange smells, odd noises around the house, and things going missing. One reported sensing something terrible in the basement, and her children spoke of horrible dreams about the ship taking them away, and the bony man from the TV watching them at night. The house is now abandoned, having been purchased and then left empty by one Adrian Grimes in early 2011. The puppets and set pieces from Candle Cove, mistakenly named Pirate Place by Grimes in the letter, an early working title for the show that Emerson Grimes later abandoned, supposedly vanished shortly before Adrian Grimes made the purchase. The whereabouts of Jason Grimes remain unknown. I don't know what actually caused it, or what the entity even was. All I know is that if I don't tell this story, I'm going to go crazy. I think it's best to just start at the beginning, and I'll allow you to make what you will out of these words. I don't expect many people to believe me. I mean, personally, I wouldn't believe it if I heard it from a stranger. But I know at least some, maybe even just one in a thousand, will believe what I have said. Those few are who this story is for, and knowing even one other person has experienced anything like this will at least give me a small amount of peace. Winter had been dragging in Maine. I lived in a small town that I won't name, but I will say it was very close to New Hampshire. I technically lived with my mom and dad, but they spent more time in their new home in Georgia at this point, so I basically lived alone. As a 22-year-old who had just finished college, it certainly didn't seem like the worst thing in the world. I didn't have a job yet, as for a while I was just focused on finishing school, and I was taking a bit of an extended break after. Like I said before, winter was still going strong in mid-March, and I was getting incredibly bored. I had watched every movie on Netflix and even went out and tried to hike in the snow as often as possible. After months of movies and walking in the cold, I was at the end of my rope. I hung out with friends sometimes, but I didn't have many who still lived nearby, as most had moved away after college. I planned to leave soon myself more than likely within a year, and I wasn't too concerned about making any new friends here. One day I was watching a random movie on Netflix and glanced out the window, noticing it was starting to get dark out. I sighed and decided it was time for a change. I needed to do anything other than the same things I'd been doing since November. The early nights and gray days had caused me to be at my breaking point. Then it occurred to me I still had a W.U. with a few games that my older brother had played more than I ever had. I didn't really like video games as much as I used to, but I figured desperate times called for desperate measures and that anything was better than watching more Netflix. I went to the basement and found the box that Wobwa 2 was in, along with a couple games. 
None sounded that appealing, so I settled on one that I didn't even remember playing called Wild Isle, a game where you choose an animal avatar that lived on an island with other animal avatars that all seemed very friendly. It seemed like a blatant knockoff of Animal Crossing, but I figured it must be different in some way. I really didn't remember this game at all, but I figured maybe my brother had gotten it as he bought most of the games back then anyway. I pretty much just picked it because it was the only option that I hadn't played thousands of times. I must say I did vaguely remember seeing some ads for it years ago, so I figured I might as well give it a shot. I turned on the game and chose the avatar of a rabbit with big eyes. I went to the island to start, and there were six other animals on it, which were a bird, a cow, a dog, a cat, a lizard, and a skunk, all of which had cartoonishly big heads and very cheery expressions. The heads of each avatar appeared on the side, showing the player how many there were. I began building my home and talking to the other animals. There wasn't that much to the game, really, and it did seem a lot like a cheaper version of Animal Crossing. The island wasn't too big either, and there wasn't all that much to do, so after about an hour I decided to call it a day. I watched some more Netflix and then went to bed around ten. That night, a little after three in the morning, I woke up with a strange feeling. I got out of bed and walked around the house to double-check everything was fine, which it was. I glanced out the front window in my room down the street. The street had a house to the left about one hundred feet away with an intersection on the opposite side that was partially blocked by the house. There were another two houses on the right, the first of which was 150 feet to the side of my house, and the other was directly across from it. I was about ready to get back into bed, when I noticed the very front of a car pull up to the corner past the house on the left. It was at the intersection and was mostly obstructed by my neighbor's house. I watched it for a second as it was rare to see cars out at 3 a.m. here, and it seemed like it wasn't moving even though it had waited at the stop sign for longer than they'd need to. All I could see of the car was it was very low to the ground, red and only about the first foot of it was visible. The car didn't move at all, and it made me feel weird, but realistically I figured there had to be a reason for it being there, and as it wasn't in front of my house I decided to go back to bed. The next morning I woke up with a strange urge to play the Animal Crossing knockoff, I found this a bit odd because it wasn't anything special, but I figured I must really just be in this big of a need of something different to do. I went to the living room and slumped down on the couch in front of the TV. I turned the console on, and as soon as the game opened, I noticed something was very different. The island was no longer sunny. It was cloudy and dark for some reason. I figured it was the kind of game that would always be sunny, but maybe it mixed it up. It was sunny outside in Maine, though, so it felt odd that the game was so dim and gray today. I walked around the island building some stuff and hoped the clouds would clear off, but they never did. The animals even seemed different than yesterday. They all seemed paranoid. I know that might sound crazy, but all of them acted like they couldn't talk to me for long, and none approached me like yesterday. I borderline had to chase some down to even talk to them. I spoke to the cow for a very brief amount of time, who just said, I wish it was a nicer day, you should be careful, which seemed incredibly strange for one of the animals to say, considering this is a game primarily targeted for kids. After about an hour again, I quit the game, and I had a weird feeling the rest of the day. The game was weird. I didn't get why it would be so glum and depressing like what was the appeal there. I was confused, but after a while I pretty much stopped caring. The whole rest of the day, though, I felt strange. It's hard to explain the kind of strange feeling, similar to the kind you get in the middle of the woods when you're completely alone and you haven't seen anyone else in hours. It just felt so bizarre, and I decided to not play the game anymore and went to bed around ten just like last night. But I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned for a few hours until I finally passed out. I was awoken again around 3 a.m. and that feeling from earlier was way worse. I quickly checked the whole house and looked out all the windows again, except the one in my room, which was the only one with the view of the street out front. The backyard was completely surrounded by trees, and that always gave me an eerie feeling, but right now, that was not even close to my main concern. When I finally checked the front window, I noticed something odd to the left. My stomach dropped a bit when I saw the same car was there and it was pulled out a bit farther than last night, but only a little so you could just see some of the hood. 
It was definitely an old red car, but other than that I still couldn't make anything out. I was kind of scared this time as it was the same car within 100 feet of my house at about the exact same time as the night before. I didn't know how it could relate to me, but it just felt incredibly weird. I watched the car for probably 20 minutes and when nothing changed I went to bed. I didn't sleep much though as I just kept trying to figure out what the deal was with the car and why I felt so paranoid all day. There didn't seem like there were many good ways to explain why the car would be there like that two nights in a row, but I still assumed there had to be a normal explanation somehow. The next morning I felt awful. I was exhausted and the paranoia was still there. I didn't want to play the game again, but after a few hours of boring Netflix and still silence, I got curious and decided to give the game one more try. I wanted to see if it was still cloudy and if the animals were still behaving strangely. I had nothing else to do, so why not write? I turned the game back on, and to my surprise it was still cloudy, and the animals were acting even stranger. But that wasn't it this time either. There was a new character. It took me a second to even realize, but there was another head that popped up on the side with the others. It looked like a goat, but it was stranger than the other characters. Where the dog and cat, for example, had bright eyes and smiling faces, the goat had reddish eyes and a very uncomfortable smile. It actually creeped me out a bit and I got an intense, paranoid feeling. The smile looked weird, like the goat had something wrong with it. I thought that this game was messed up and I questioned how anyone could make something like this for kids. I wanted to find the goat, though, to see if the avatar was as weird-looking as the head on the side was. I hoped that it wasn't and that I was just creeping myself out for no reason. As I walked around, though I couldn't find him, I tried to see if I could figure out anything by talking to the animals, but none of them wanted to say a word. The only one I talked to was the cat, who told me simply, run, which was deeply unsettling. The cat was also taken away from me by the cow who seemed to be scolding him. This was so weird. I couldn't even figure out what was going on. I quickly turned the game off as I truly felt creeped out. I didn't see the actual goat, but I don't think I even really wanted to. I spent the rest of the day in a paranoid mess wondering if I should go to one of my three remaining friends' houses for a bit, but a sudden heavy snowstorm made me reconsider. As night fell and the thick snow continued, I thought about going to bed even though it was only nine. I was so tired from the night before and a day's worth of anxiety blended with that was enough of a mix to make my eyes really heavy. I laid down and fell asleep in a matter of minutes. My worst fear happened, though, as I woke up and glanced at my alarm clock to see that it was 3.13, the same time it had been every time I had been awoken. I skipped the house search and went straight to the window in my room. I took a step back as the snow was still coming down heavily, and it startled me at first. I glanced down the road and thought I was relieved as there was so much snow I didn't see anything, but after a double take my heart almost stopped. The car was there, in the same spot except it was pulled out even farther than the first two nights, and now the front window was visible. The snow in my line of sight almost seemed to stop right at the perfect time, as it literally looked like someone with horns was sitting in the front seat. I quickly shut the blinds and sat down. There was no way the person had horns. I had to have been mistaken with all the snow. Even though I couldn't piece together what it could have been, I knew it couldn't be that. I dared to look out again and saw it was still there, and even more so, it really did look like horns. To my absolute horror, it didn't even look like a person, more like an animal. Actually, it looked like the goat from the game, and it was staring right at me. Like if the goat somehow looked like how it would in real life if something that insane could exist. I quickly shut the blinds and started panicking. I tried to deny what I had just seen, but I knew what it was. It was the goat from the game, I'd bet anything on it. It's an insane feeling to accept something that seems impossible. But when you know it's not anything normal, you have to realize the truth. It was clear that it wasn't human, and it was also clear it was looking at me. I made sure all the doors were locked, and I put the game back in the basement where I first found it. I decided tomorrow I'd call my brother and ask him about this game or whatever it was because none of this made any sense. How could a goat be driving a car, and how could it look just like the goat from the game? I couldn't even decide which seemed more insane. I know a goat driving a car is ridiculous, but this thing it like wasn't even truly a goat. 
Its facial features were human-like, creepy as you could think, but with a very human element, especially in the eyes and smile. It was as if you somehow mixed a goat with a very sadistic human being. Whatever you picture when you think of that, I promise this thing was even worse. I stayed up the whole rest of that night, but didn't dare to look out the window until it was light out, and when I finally did, that thing was thankfully gone. Once it was late enough for my brother to be up, I called him and asked about the game. He said he used to play it all the time, and it was kind of dumb, but everything I said sounded crazy to him. He said it was always sunny and all the animals were super nice, and he had never seen a goat. I thanked him and hung up quickly once I realized how crazy I probably sounded to him. I wanted to tell him more, but this seemed like the kind of thing that no one, especially not my very non-superstitious brother, would believe. What he said did not make me feel better. If anything, it was much worse. Why was the game like this if it's normally different? Why was this seemingly normal game so strange on my WI2? I spent the next few hours trying to connect any dots, but none of it made any sense at all. I fought the urge to get in my car and start heading down to Georgia, because I was really starting to get scared. Something was wrong, deeply fundamentally wrong if something from a video game was also out in the real world, and if that something appeared to be an evil goat for lack of a better explanation. I thought about life and what humans all accept and what it means on a bigger scale for this to be happening. The only local explanation to me was that the game had some kind of curse or something like that. You know something is crazy if the most logical explanation is a curse. The worst part was I had such a strong urge to play the game again. That may seem nuts, but I needed to see what was going on. It had gotten progressively stranger every day, and I had to see if that trend was going to continue. I also wanted to get a better look at the goat and see if I could shed any more light on what I could possibly be dealing with. I went down to the basement and grabbed the game. Even touching it made me scared, but I powered through. I turned the game on and almost jumped out of my chair. Unlike last time, I did see the goat, and it was standing in the middle of the map, staring at the screen. All of the characters in the game were hiding, and I noticed something below the goat. Lying on the ground in front of it was the cat, with its head removed and in red which appeared to be the cat's blood, the word run, was spelled out at an angle where I could easily read it. The goat seemed to be staring into my eyes through the screen somehow, and his sadistic smile seemed even bigger than before. The other animals also seemed to be looking at me, and they looked terrified. All of them were hiding and peeking out from behind trees and houses. My avatar was also hiding with them, even though my controller was not causing him to do that. The game was only probably on for a minute total before I turned it off. I was petrified. Something was wrong with this game, whether it be a curse or whatever you want to call it, and I wasn't going to sit around and think of a logical explanation. I just wanted to get as far away from this game as I could. I grabbed the game and put it in the trash and took the trash can outside and walked it to the curb. Then I called my parents and asked if I could come down there for a bit and they said that would be fine. I got ready to go as it was a very far drive and I likely would have to stop halfway and sleep in my car. I didn't care at all. I just wanted to get out of here. I had to be smart though as it was getting dark and the snow was deep outside, so I made the tough choice to leave first thing in the morning. I thought there was a chance maybe this was over now that the game was no longer in the house. I'm not sure if I believed it at all but it made the thought of sleeping one more night a little more bearable. I even unplugged the W2 and the TV, the one in the living room and the one in my bedroom that didn't even work anymore. After a few hours of fear, I decided to go to bed before nine, as I just hoped to sleep and leave as early as possible. I set my alarm for 5.30 and hoped that would be what woke me up, and not the all-too-familiar 3.13. That didn't happen, though, not even close. I fell asleep pretty quickly, but I woke up at 3.13 just like I feared and I glanced around the room, barely wanting to open my eyes. I slowly did the now routine check of the house, and everything appeared to be fine. I then made the tough choice to look outside down the street and see if the car was there. At this point I figured it would be, and I glanced at my packed bag ready to run to my car if I needed to. I glanced out the window down the street to the left, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The car was actually gone. I was so relieved. I turned my head back down to the right to be safe, 
and I almost fell when I saw our driveway. The red car was parked right next to my car, and it clearly was empty. Just then I heard my broken TV turn on, and I was looking at the same image as earlier, even though the TV was broken and unplugged, not to mention that the Y2 was in the other room. The goat was on screen, and it walked past the dead cat, and now all the bodies of the other animals. Mine was the only one left, even though all of his limbs were removed, and he appeared to be crying. The goat then pointed at me through the screen, and then back at the avatar on the ground. In the most insane thing I've ever seen, he reached towards the screen, and like someone emerging from underwater, a goat's arm came through the screen with a human-like hand at the end instead of a hoof. Once the arm came through, the horrible head I had seen in the car before did also. I froze in fear as I couldn't even fathom what was happening, but then I realized it was reached for me. I snapped out of the trance I was in just as the hand grabbed my leg and began dragging me towards the TV. I screamed and fought against it, but the hand pulled me closer. The goat slowly dissolved back into the game and my leg went with him. As my leg went through the screen, it turned into an animated rabbit's leg in the game. I kicked and kicked until the goat let go, and I pulled my leg back into the real world. I picked up the packed bag and ran out the front door without turning around. I glanced at the red car as I struggled to unlock mine and saw the back seat was full of copies of the game. I got in my car and glanced back at the house. The goat was standing in my bedroom window staring back at me with that horrible smile. I gunned my car in reverse and turned down the road heading towards the interstate. I glanced in my rearview mirror every minute as I couldn't shake the feeling of being followed. After I escaped from my house, I drove for hours and made it to Virginia, which is where I'm writing this from. I'm going to sleep at a tourist center for the night as I'm so tired from the stress and the long drive. I know my story sounds insane, but I swear it really happened, and I just want to warn people about this game and about whatever that goat thing was. I honestly can't wait to see my parents and to be away from that house for a while. The worst part is whenever I do have to go back, I don't know what I'm even going to do. Being alone in that house after what happened seems impossible, and I don't know how to explain to my family why I can't go back there. I hope anyone who reads this has had a similar experience because talking to someone who can relate, even in a different country across the world, would make me feel 1,000 times better. Every red car I see borderline gives me a heart attack, and I'm terrified this thing is following me. I've still been getting that strange paranoia every 30 minutes, and there's no logical reason why. I just have this awful feeling that this thing is going to show up again soon. If a red car pulls into this parking lot at 313, I really don't know what I'm going to do. If anyone can offer any help, or even knows anyone that can please let me know. I'm terrified that this isn't over. <laughs>